Chances are, if you're into logic puzzles, you've probably seen some version of Prisoner's Head problem before. And in fact, there is a Wikipedia page, which I'll link down below, that lists many different variants of this problem. But I want to showcase today probably one of the hardest versions that I've seen uh, for this problem with infinitely many prisoners and infinitely many different number that can be written on the head. I personally learned it from a PhD student back in undergrad, but I'm not sure who exactly came up with this one from the start. It is essentially the same idea as one of the later variants in the Wikipedia page as well. So if anyone knows the origin of this, I'd love to know. But having said that, the problem goes as follows. First of all, you have countably many prisoners in the room, which means there is a one-tone correspondence between the prisoners and the natural numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. On the screen, I just drew five of them, but there are infinitely many of them, countably many to be precise. On top of each prisoner, there is a hat, and written on each hat is some real number. Maybe on this hat, there is E. Maybe on this hat, there is 1.5. Maybe on this hat, there is negative 1.1 repeating. I don't know, but it can be irrational number, rational number, but there, there is a number written on every single hat. Now, the every prisoner, so say for this prisoner, he or she can see all the other numbers. So this person can see 1.5, negative 1.1 repeating, but this person does not know what number is written on top of his or her head. And what the prisoners have to do is they have to guess what number is written on top of their head all at the same time. So that's the key part. Everyone has to guess exactly at the same time. So everyone is going to shout out a number. And if you, if you shout out the correct number, so say if this person says E and the, that person gets it correct, if this person says, say, like 1.4, then this is wrong, and so on. So everyone guesses at the same time. And the only way that everyone goes home and everyone's set free is if there are only finitely many wrong guesses. So again, the goal is that all but finitely many of the prisoners has to guess correctly. Now, obviously, this sounds completely impossible, and there is a little bit of a catch, which means that every prisoner is extremely smart, like to the extent that anything that's doable within the realm of mathematics, so any mathematical operation, even if it's infinitely complex, every prisoner can do. And before, before these numbers are written on their heads, all of the prisoners are going to have a gigantic meeting, all the countably many, infinitely many prisoners, and they can come up with any sort of plan, any sort of ideas that they are going to use to try to guess the head once the numbers are actually written on the head. Even assuming all of that, even assuming all of that, when I first heard this problem, this, this seemed absolutely insane. Like, usually if you know the, how the prisoners have problems tend to go, usually there, there's some information you gain by allowing the prisoners go one at a time. So maybe the prisoner number one is going to guess first, then prisoner number two is going to guess, but at least prisoner number two has some information that can maybe be derived from what the prisoner one said. Maybe the prisoner one says something systematically to give prisoner two some information about his head. Even then, it's not clear how you do this, but at least you have something to go off of. But here, everyone guesses at the same time. So, so even if you do this planning beforehand, how can that really help? I encourage you to pause the video and think this through on your own. But I think the solution is pretty unexpected and requires some pretty clever insights. So don't get too frustrated if you don't see it. But I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you the solution now. Since we have countably many prisoners, let's say A1 a2, a3, a4, a5. These are the numbers written on top of the hat. For example, a1 is the number on hat 1. So that's the hat worn by prisoner 1. And a2 is the number on hat 2, and so on. Now the key idea in the solution is, is the following. So say I give you two different sequences of real numbers. So for example, consider a sequence like 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. I, I just wrote powers of 2 here, for example. And consider a sequence that's basically the same, basically the same as the sequence, except I only change finitely many things. So for example, I, I might change this 4 to maybe like square root of 5. I might change this 32 to some other number, maybe like negative 20. But other than, other than finitely many edits or finitely many discrepancies, 
the two sequences are identical. And what we're gonna say is that if they only differ in finitely many places, we're gonna say these are equivalent sequences. So we're gonna call these two sequences equivalent. Now, for example, if I also consider like powers of 3, like 3, 9, 27, 81, and so on, then this sequence and the sequence are fundamentally different. We cannot go from one to the other by just changing finitely many things. So these two would not be equivalent, right? So when, what happens now is that if you consider all possible sequences, all possible sequences of real numbers, so imagine like this gigantic set, so this is a set of sequences of real numbers, for example, one possible element is this 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. There is this another possibility like 2, square root of 5, 8, 16, minus 20, 64. And I guess I also mentioned the powers of 3, for example, 9, 27, 81, 243, and so on. Now, what happens is that this gigantic set gets partitioned into infinitely many equivalence classes. So, for example, like there might be an equivalence class here which consists of all the sequences that are equivalent to this 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64 sequence. I mean, I can throw in one more maybe. Instead of starting at 2, I can start at 5, but 5, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, this is also an equivalent sequence. So any, any sequence that's equivalent to any one of these uh, is going to be within this, within this subset in this partition. There's going to be a partition consisting of the 3, 9, 27, 81. And of course, it's going to have many more sequences listed inside, infinitely many in fact, what happens is that this entire set, this entire set of sequences of real numbers gets partitioned into these sorts of smaller, smaller sets, where if I just focus on any one of these sets, or this one, and so on, all of, all of the elements within that subset are equivalent. And here's what the prisoners are going to do. They are all going to get together before this event. Everyone is going to agree on one element from each one of these equivalence classes. Like for example, for this equivalence class, everyone's gonna get together uh, beforehand and everyone's going to memorize, say, this 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. It doesn't have to be this one, but everyone picks the same one and memorizes the same one. That's the key thing. And maybe within, within this subset, I mean, there could be many, many other sequences. There could also be 4, 9, 27, 81 and so on, which is also the same as 3, 9, 27, 81. And maybe everyone in everyone for this one just decides to memorize this 4, 9, 27, 81. Within this equivalence class, they memorize some sequence here. But everyone memorizes the same sequence from each one of these equivalence classes. And now the day actually comes and the numbers A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, these numbers are written on top of the hat. And what is going to happen now? Well, say I'm prisoner one. Say I'm prisoner one. Well then I see a2, a3, a4, a5, and so on. So I'm I'm missing I'm missing this one a1 from from the entire sequence. So I'm missing a finitely many information. In fact, just one entry from this entire sequence. So I know which equivalence class that the entire sequence lies in. Like for example, suppose a1, a2, a3, a4, a5. The sequence just happened to be powers of three. So maybe those three, nine, twenty-seven, eighty-one. 243, except, except finitely many terms got messed up. Maybe instead of 27 and 3, we had negative 4 and maybe like negative 8. But that doesn't matter. The first person sees the second term, third term, fourth term, fifth term, and so on. And by looking at this infinite tail of the sequence, that person can recognize this entire sequence belongs to this, this equivalence class because it only differs in finitely many places Then this 4, 9, 27, 81, and so on. So the first prisoner is going to recall this particular sequence that everyone memorized the day before. What about the second prisoner? Well, the second prisoner says that the first entry is minus 4, third term is minus 8, fourth term is 81, and so on. He or she doesn't get to see this second entry, but we still get to see the tail of the sequence. We see what happens eventually forever. So that's already enough, since I'm only just missing finitely many information, to also gravitate towards the same equivalence class, and this person is also going to remember this 4, 9, 27, 81, this representative picked the day before. So the point is, all the, all the prisoners, every single prisoner, is going, to, is going to remember this 4, 9, 27, 81, and they are going to guess the entry based on this. So A1 is going to guess 4, A2 is going to guess 9, A3 is going to guess 27, A4 is going to guess 81, A5 is going to guess 243, and so on. 
And now what happened is since since this sequence, since this this sequence that everyone memorized, and the actual sequence only differs in finitely many places. They only differ in finitely many places. We are only going to get we are only going to get finitely many incorrect guesses. So we have satisfied we have satisfied our goal. Like for example, for this sequence, we messed up at negative four and we messed up at negative eight. But eventually, like starting at eighty one and afterwards, the sequence completely agrees with this representative that we memorized. So everyone's going to get it correct after this. Now there's one important thing that I do need to say for any math major or anyone pretty serious about mathematics watching this is that we actually used axiom of choice here. So we used axiom of choice in a pretty fundamental way. And what axiom of choice says is that even if we have uncountably many collection of sets, like for example, we have this set, we have this set, we have this set, we have this set, there are uncountably many of them as you can verify in this example. But despite that, it is possible to pick a representative from each one. For example, I pick this one as the representative of the first set. I pick this one as the representative of this one. I pick the, the, some sequence as the representative of this one. So we assume that there was this, like some sort of systematic way of being able to pick an element of choosing a representative from each set in this uncountable collection. And this actually, at one point in the history of mathematics, uh, used to be a pretty controversial axiom to even assume. And there are a lot of subtleties that lies with an axiom of choice that I'm not just going to get to in this video, but this was this was definitely used in an important way, at least the way I presented this. So anyway, assuming axiom of choice, we have we have figured out how to do this prisoner's head problem.